the Walker Art Center for a Regis Dialogue with German filmmaker and writer Doris Dörje. Her films include Men, Am I Beautiful, Nobody Loves Me, and Enlightenment Guaranteed, which we'll discuss with her this evening. I'm Klaus Phillips, Chair of the German and Russian Department at Hollands University in Roanoke, Virginia. I'll be your guide through this Regis Dialogue. Well, Doris, let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little something about what it was like growing up one of four girls in <laughs> Hanover. Well, for my sisters, it was a nightmare. For myself, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, what was it like? My parents, both of them are doctors. We grew up in a hospital, in their own little hospital. And um, very early on, I, I started using my sisters as actresses. And um, I would get really mad at them because they were not able to memorize lines and they would not do what I wanted them to do. Do you remember what movies you saw when you were little? Let's say 10, 12, something like that. Very, very few. We didn't have a TV set. The entire family sat down after dinner to read. And um, once every six months or so, my father would take me to the movies. And uh, I saw all of the um, Vinitu films, those were adaptions of, of novels by a German writer who wrote, I don't know, 20 or 125 novels about American Indians, but he had never once been in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and um, those movies, after his novels, they were my, my uh, first movie experiences. You're not making your daughter Carla read all of Karl May, are you? Oh, no, she would never. She reads Harry <laughs> Potter, not Karl May. Uh, of course, yes. You attended the Humanistische Gymnasium, correct? And studied Latin and Greek. Do you remember the first Latin sentence you learned? Gaia mm. est divisum in tres partes, like everybody. Oh, things are different in Hanover <laughs> from the way they are in Bavaria then, I remember. Agricola arat puella amat. Oh. And I mm -hmm. almost became a writer because of that, because I thought I have to grow up and, and you know, do something to show where these people were at. The farmer plows, the girl loves, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, you, went, you went to Stockton, California in 1973 to study at the uh, University of the Pacific. What did you study there? Drama. Mm -hmm. And then you went to New York and took courses at the New School for Social Research. Yeah, that I did because I, I wanted to get into NYU Film School, but um, I just didn't have the money and um, I was trying to you know, find a job and make enough money to pay for a living and I could never you know, save enough money to pay for a tuition fee. So my mother kept sending me the application forms for the film school in Munich, which is for free. And every month these application forms would arrive and I would just throw them out month after month after month. And then about, well, after about a year, I was ripe. <laughs> I just realized that I, I could never make enough money to get into NYU Film School and you know, support myself in New York. So I filled out those forms and I got accepted at the Munich Film School and went back, much to my chagrin. I really didn't want to go back at mm -hmm. all. Before you returned to Munich and to the HFF, did you have any kind of clear sense of what was happening in the so-called New German cinema? Um, yeah, Fassbender had made a big impression on me. Mm -hmm in school, um, and, but it was mostly the French Nouvelle Vague films that I grew up with. I think also American films, right? That the came so later, that came in, in, that in came the in States, America. yeah, oh. when I came to California. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, you're teaching at the HFF at this point, so I gather it was a thoroughly good experience, your three years there? Yeah, I didn't really go to school ever. Um, we were completely left alone. We could do whatever we wanted to do. You know, it was in the early 70s uh, where everything was much more free-floating than it is now. And <laughs> what really horrifies me, though, is that the professors back then were old people. And um, <laughs> now I realize they were 35, maybe. You know, they were younger, much younger than I'm now. They're still there. Yeah. <laughs> One of the very first films you made was called Obsturmt oder Schneid. Is that a line from the Panzerlied, I think? 
No, it's just a Bavarian saying. Aha, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Whether <laughs> rain or shine. Yeah. Oh, he's on his luck. Yeah. Um, a one and a half hour documentary, right, about a very interesting woman. Can you tell us something about what it's about? Yeah, it was during the time where movie theaters in the country closed down or had to close down because of TV. And um, it was called the, the Big Dying of the Movie Theaters. And we had found a movie theater in Rosenheim, 60 miles outside of Munich, which had 550 seats. It was run by a 75 year old lady who had to um, let her entire staff go because she couldn't pay for them anymore because nobody would come see the films. So she would do everything herself. She would heat up the theater with coal, then she would sell ice cream, would run back to the projection booth to get the film going, um, go back to the, to the entrance to sell tickets. And she was a one-woman one one woman show. And um, she kept saying, my, my movie theater is like the Titanic. It won't sink, which didn't make too much sense. <laughs> That's a great line. Did she run the theater long enough to be able to show some of your films later on? Uh, yes, she became quite famous, um, partially because of this documentary, because nobody in the art world had realized that there were uh, people out there, movie theater owners, who really did love the cinema and were willing to put up with um, a very desperate situation and still kept their movie theater going. And then she got support from the, the Bavarian government and she became this icon of, uh, of a movie theater owner. Yeah. Is there anything which, in retrospect, you would have done differently during the years at the HFF? Because you made movies like crazy already during that time. Yeah, I keep telling my students that they should not hurry up as much as I did. I was so eager to get out of school and I don't really know why. I was always in a hurry. I have been in a hurry all my life, I don't know why. And I missed out on a chance to really play around without any commercial pressure. And for some reason, I, I pu I've put this commercial pressure on myself very early on. You made a series of documentaries, television uh, features, one children's film, I believe, films with titles such as Hetzt was gescheit's fremd, yeah? Or, um, yeah, what was the children's film called? I forgot. Paula is Portugal. Paula is yeah. Portugal, of course, right. Um, was working for television, doing an assignment for television at that time in the early 70s, totally different as an experience from what you're experiencing now? No, not really, because uh, I, maybe because I'm so extremely stubborn. I have always done whatever I wanted. And even back then, at the documentaries that I did for TV, they somehow let me do whatever I wanted to do. And I made several films about juvenile delinquents in the suburb of Munich. And they just let me go. They gave me camera and crew and let me do whatever I wanted to do. I don't know, maybe they were scared of me. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I was pretty much yeah, free to do whatever I wanted to do. Well, your narrative feature film debut came in 1983 with a film that was screened here last Saturday, Straight to the Heart, starring Beate Janssen and Sepp Bierbichler. And we'll look at a clip from that film at this point. I just realized again, looking at the film a few days ago, that that scene that we just saw when they're first in bed together, in terms of technique, reminds me so much of a similar sequence in The Marriage of Maria Brown. Was that, was that a conscious uh, relationship or did it just happen that way? I wasn't aware of anything <laughs> when I shot the film. It was my first feature. I was uh, scared and uh, didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying to get through it somehow and I could not think of any other films <laughs> while I was doing it. Well, what we have in this film, of course, is the narrative of two unlikely lovers, a middle-aged dentist and a madcap blue-haired girl who writes letters to herself, um, is rooted uh, in, the short, in one of the short stories that you wrote, the one from your first collection, Love, Pain, and the Whole Damn Thing. Um, the issues that face these people seriously hamper their communication 
efforts. I'm wondering how at that point, at that stage for a first feature, you decided, uh, or for a first story, you decided on that kind of narrative, on that kind of subject. Well, do you want to hear the truth? It's really sure. quite embarrassing. <laughs> I had a boyfriend who was a dentist, just like the guy in the mm -hmm. film, uh, was born under the same sign, just like the actor, looked very much like this actor, looked like his twin brother, and we had a very complicated relationship, and I wanted to break up with him. Um, so I sat down and wrote the story about a girl who lives with a dentist, and in the end kills the dentist, this guy, with a hairdryer. <laughs> Um, in my recollection, um, the story didn't have very much to do with my private life. I thought it was something completely different. The film came out, the dentist saw the film, I had meanwhile broken up with him while I was shooting this film, and um, he didn't see any, any um, um, he, he didn't think it had anything to do with him either. But everybody else, of course, knew that this was him because he looked exactly like the guy in the film spoke, said exactly the same lines as the guy in the film. But as it is always, or a lot of times the case, he was very flattered. <laughs> Although the guy in the film is, uh, well, what shall I call it? Um, not so nice. He's a yeah. macho pig, yeah. to be quite, <laughs> quite yeah. blatant about it. Well, even though it's a film about a serious subject, it's at times a very, very funny film. And one recent American critic tried to look at this particular film uh, in, in line with the heritage of the American screwball comedy, that really what we have here is two totally different people, especially a young woman uh, who, is, who is quite unconventional. And uh, if we try to look at her with images of Catherine Hepburn in mind in a movie such as Bringing Up Baby, are we totally on the wrong track? Is that what went through your mind at the time? Well, you know, um, you're, you're a scholar and it, you look at films from a very different angle than, than I do. I have seen all these films, or I, when I did the film, I, I had seen many uh, screwball comedies, but I wasn't really aware of a film history when, when I started writing my own screenplays and shooting my own films. But what was really very important for me was having been in the state, in this, in this country, uh, and having picked up on, on a certain narrative style, which had not that much to do with the movies, but with actual communication. Mm -hmm. Or to, to phrase it in, in an easier way, much, much simpler way, I had to learn to be fun in this country. <laughs> and I think that really saved me. I'm very, very grateful for this until this day. <laughs> I learned the most important lessons in my life to, to, um, be, um, to be able to, to laugh at yourself, self-irony, a certain sense of humor, and a certain lightness. And um, that, I think, was uh, very important for, my pro for me in my private life, but also very, very important for my um, career as a storyteller, as a filmmaker and, and writer. So you're saying Germans don't have the same kind of sense of humor? I'm not saying that. They have a sense of humor, but um, they don't like to see things very lightly because somehow it's, it's a flaw or it's, I don't know. You, you can't be taken seriously if you take things too lightly. Uh, just one tiny example to, to um, make it a little clearer. When I came to California, people, of course, kept asking me, how are you, how are you doing? And as a German, I would think very hard and then say, well, this morning I woke up and I had a little headache. <laughs> and then, you know, it, the weather was nice, but I was still a little depressed. And I would just come up with these long answers. <laughs> you know, the way you'd answer these questions in, in Germany, be very seriously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Turkish people figure prominently into this film and, of course, several of your later films. Um, the fact that Anna at the end with the kidnapped Turkish baby gets into a bus filled with Turkish people heading home to Turkey. Um, shows what? A solidarity with the Turks? Yeah, yeah. and I wanted them to be in my story because um, mm, to me they were a very important part of Germany very early on, not just the Turks but all foreigners, 
which is probably largely due to my very cosmopolitan family, we uh, traveled as, as children um, a great deal, which other people then really didn't. They did not go on vacations yet, you know, through Italy and Spain. And we went to Africa, we went all kinds of places. So I was maybe much more aware than other children uh, of the fact that, uh, yes, there were not only Germans living in Germany, but many other ethnic groups. And yeah, they, they keep reappearing, the different ethnic groups in, in all of my films. And it's, it's also a political statement because up to this day, there's a, a policy of almost every party to not really uh, negotiate except the fact that yes, we are an immigrant country. It's a big issue in Germany up to this day. Is there also a north-south element at play in this story with the casting of Bielbichler and Beate Janssen that clearly you do yeah, have at Bavaria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then when I, I did um, Straight to the Heart, Bavaria was still a very exotic place to me and I had difficulties understanding the dialect. And to me, there were the Bavarians were much more exotic than, than I don't know, <laughs> people from Alaska or from, from Africa or from Asia. That's a very special tribe. <laughs> As a semi-quasi-Bavarian, I can say absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, you look for literary inspiration for the name of Anna Blume, though, and that's where Kutschwitters comes in. Right? Yeah. yeah. Kutschwitters is an artist from my hometown, Hanover. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my grandfather tried to save some of his work during the Nazi times, not very successfully. So he was a Dada artist who um, wrote up um, Dada poems and, and put them up on, on big uh, billboards in the city. And this one poem, which is quite famous, Anna Blume. Your next film, In the Belly of the Whale, which came out in 1984, could be called a road movie of sorts, I suppose. It's based on a screenplay co-written with Michael Juncker. And it continues in the vein of what German reviewers have called a Problemfilm. Uh, can you tell us in a nutshell what happens in that film? Mm. Can mm. you? <laughs> Let in me see. In a think. nutshell? I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Basically, I guess I can. Yes, we have a policeman um, who has a short fuse, who is the head, I guess we could say, of a, of a disintegrated family whose wife left them 10 years ago. Uh, and whose 15-year-old daughter, Carla, um, is trying to run away and find her mother. And on the way to do that, she encounters a musician, I think Rick is, right? And uh, her father lists her as having been kidnapped. The mother returns home, and the father, um, more by mistake than anything else, doesn't mean to kill his wife, but he kills her, he shoots her. And the daughter returns and acts very protectively towards the formerly abusing father. I guess that's it in a large nutshell. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult story. To what makes her do that at the end? Oh, because I think children are really always the protectors of their parents, or they want to be. And no matter how abusive and horrible parents treat them, children will always try to protect their parents which I f find very disturbing and very touching, but also very, a very difficult subject matter, that children will always try to take their parents' side. Um, that was one thing, and the other thing was that I really wanted to make a movie with a whale in it, because when I was about five years old, a whale came to Hanover, to my hometown, a dead whale on a truck. <laughs> and it was maybe the most um, exciting thing that I've that I've ever seen in my entire life. For about a year, I could not sleep because of the whale. And I would wake up my parents for an entire year and ask questions about the whale. How does a whale have, have its little whales underwater? And how does a whale eat underwater? And all these things that I could not imagine. And I had gotten a little, when the whale was being exhibited, I, I got a little flyer. And it said on the flyer that the heart of the whale weighs as much as a Volkswagen Beetle. And we had a Volkswagen Beetle at that time. And I remember so clearly sitting in this Volkswagen and trying to imagine this is as heavy, this car that I'm sitting in right now is as heavy as the heart of a whale. And somehow I could feel my head explode because I could not imagine it. The whale drove me crazy. So for this movie, we tracked down the whale. It was really the same whale 20 years later in Bayreuth 
Wagner's city, you know, Bayreuth, there was the whale. And we, uh, we dragged the whale back up to, Hanover, uh, to Hamburg, where there's a tunnel in the middle of the city. Um, we made the truck go through this tunnel and produced the biggest traffic jam in the history of Hamburg because the whale got stuck. And <laughs> so we were in every paper, and it was a really good promotion thing. <laughs> Now, in the context of the film, the whale, it seems to me, represents actually something very positive because it's depicted on a photograph that shows the family in better times when yeah. there was harmony, uh, something irreparably lost, perhaps. Yeah. 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 An American reviewer recently wrote that in all of your films, including this one, there's a streak of something very dark and violent beneath the surface, and that this mood of nihilism sometimes commands the final word, while at other times, in other films, it lurks repressed, giving an edge to the trenchant humor. And what she means, I guess, is that in the case of Straight to the Heart, um, the main character could have thrown, instead of the hairdryer, herself into the bathtub with Zepp Bierbichler, right? <laughs> and it might have been a completely different, uh, much more humorous situation. So the, yeah. The, the line, <laughs> the thin line, maybe not, but the thin line uh, between high comedy and utmost tragedy, normally a very thin one, appears particularly thin in your films. That's not supposed to happen yet. <laughs> dark was the, the clue here, <laughs> the dark side. <laughs> I think I should be. Well, this film, which you'll have an opportunity to see this coming Thursday, became the most successful film in Germany in 1986. It beat Out of Africa, it beat Rocky IV, R it and beat Rambo, Rambo. <laughs> yes. at the box office. And that surprised you, didn't it? You weren't expecting that. No, nobody was. No, yeah. nobody. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. A lot of people went back a second, a third, a fifth time. How come? I don't know. It was probably the zeitgeist. Uh, more than 10% of the population went to see the film. Yeah. And it was a phenomena. It had nothing to do with success. It was more than, than success. It was a phenomena. And it had nothing to do really maybe with us, the makers of the film, me as the director, or the film itself. Um, you know, there was a, the, the things that you can never really explain. And it was difficult for me in particular, but also for the actors to deal with it because overnight all of us became stars. Really like from one day to the next. Well, one, one of the things I would argue that happened very clearly is that German audiences encountered um, dialogues that they hadn't heard in a long time, and especially uh, with a pacing and with a sense of humor. Uh, the, one of the things that, that my friends uh, at the time told me, uh, they went back a second time, a fourth time, because uh, they missed the punchline, because there were so <laughs> many jokes, it was so funny, there were so many moments that they had to, that they had to return to, to catch it all the yeah, second it was very or the fourth fast, time around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of pacing, though, one thing I noticed when I looked at these clips, the two that we just saw, the two sequences, um, which are followed by the scene in the laundromat, that all three of these sequences are approximately the same length, two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. So your, your pacing throughout this film was something very, very conscious. It's really, uh, no, it just happened? No, it just <laughs> happened. The reason why the film doesn't have many cuts was because we didn't have very much time. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's yes. always very frustrating to talk to filmmakers because all the theories usually fall, fall flat. And there are very banal reasons behind just everything. <laughs> Sorry, Klaus. Well, you did shoot it in a hurry. But, in the yeah, sense we only had 21 it, days. Yeah. We had no money. Um, and um, we couldn't really afford many, many shots, yeah. time-wise and money-wise. Yeah. Well, when Julius tells Stefan, as we saw in the clip, that he doesn't let problems bother him, that he gets rid of them, it seems to me he's really summarizing one of the film's central themes. Instead of changing himself, he turns his rival into a mirror image of himself. <clears throat> and the changes that he experiences appear to, to be minor and maybe only temporary. Isn't the ending really quite open when you come right down to it, when he returns home to his wife? 
No, and I think that was one of the reasons why this film became so successful, not only in Germany, but really worldwide, that it hit the, very, the right moment. Um, it was the moment of abandoning uh, political ideas and becoming more adjusted to, to the way capitalism works in the end and to going back to, um, well, the opportunist way, if I want to phrase it in a little... Um, so the generation of 68 selling out? Yeah, but those yeah. were the, the guys, or the, well, mostly the guys who were older than me. And the story um, I got from sharing a flat with them. And again, you know, there was uh, not a dentist, but a doctor uh, living in this, in this flat who owned or made more money than the rest of us. And he owned a Mercedes, but he hid this Mercedes in a garage that he had rented just to hide his Mercedes because it was politically uncool to own a Mercedes. And I found out. And I also found out that he bought silk shirts, which he also hid. So the poor guy had to hide all these things that he was enjoying because politically they were not okay, they were not correct. And um, he had a credit card that nobody was allowed to see and you know, all these little items. And to me it was very funny how these guys led all these heavy-duty political discussions with each other and they were drifting off into a totally different direction at the same time. And that's how these two characters um, were born. They were really written from observations in my, in my flat, in the flat that I was li living in at the time. I realize I'm setting myself up for getting shot down one more time, but I'm going to try it anyway. Uh, the end credit sequence in this film, the one involving the Pater Noster, which is not a Mater Noster, contrasted against the spatial symbolism of Stefan's apartment, which, as one reviewer recently pointed out, is really an erotic landscape of circles and holes. So if we look mm. at the apartment, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at the apartment that way, but we acknowledge that the paternoster has compartmentalized space, which in the instance of Stefan and Julius is almost completely filled by two men who at that point are almost undressed, and where on the other hand we have a same-sized compartment filled by, uh, by the woman, uh, who doesn't fill the space anywhere nearly. Uh, this particular reviewer came up with a definitive analysis that this, of course, signifies that, that the woman really has, has no space, has no place. Was that planned that way? <laughs> no, I was following uh, the theory of a famous Russian structuralist, Dmitry Dimitrovovich. Um, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> I got shot down. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, in the broadest sense, men is about human relationships first and gendered relationships second. Clearly, the relationship between Stefan and Daniel is couched in a context reminiscent of marriage. It certainly seems that way many times. But if now somebody says there are very definitely homoerotic overtones, maybe even potentially homosexual overtones, is that just in the eye of the viewer, or is that part of what you had intended? No, I think that's how male bonding works. It, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, with um, homoerotic, homoerotic um, tendencies. It's just the way men communicate. They have to beat each other up, and then they become friends. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, <laughs> to us women, it's a strange concept. Mm -hmm. We buy shoes and then buy, become friends. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Well, you do, of course, show quite clearly in this film that every guy is exploiting somebody else. We have Stefan dominating the relationship with, with Daniel at first, when, when Daniel first moves in. Uh, he also dominates his housemate, Lothar, who warns Daniel shortly thereafter that Stefan sees himself as the lord of the manor. And Lothar dominates his girlfriend, Angelica, clearly. So that's domination as an important aspect of relationships clearly is there. Yeah, well, where, you know, what I wanted to describe was really the, the, the funny potential, the potential for a comedy um, and, and the um, divergence between 
of ideology and people's actual behavior, because that struck me as, as very funny. It, and th in those times, people were still very ideological all the time. It was very verbal, very ideological, very political, and at the same time, in everyday life, people would constantly contradict their big ideologies. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, a film student uh, watching these people being very important, very political, and I just mm -hmm. kept taking notes about their hidden silk shirts and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after ranting about the evils of capitalism, they'd go out and buy Porsches, right? That sort of thing. On November the 3rd, 1986, Der Spiegel ran a cover story on Doris Derje, die Männerfrau, and called you Germany's most successful filmmaking woman. That had to have had an effect on you. Yeah, that's when it became scary. Yeah. I was not prepared for that. And you know, the cover of the Spiegel is like the cover of, of Time magazine. And um, after that, I, I knew that I had to um, either get off the, out of the country real fast or um, make another film really fast. And that's what I did. I made another movie very fast after Men, which did not fulfill any of the expectations that were put upon me. Everybody was expecting something like yeah. men. Again. Yeah, of course. And, <laughs> and it's not. No. It has some similarities. It contains a triangular relationship. Uh, like men, it features a knife. But as we'll see in the upcoming clip, and I must warn the squeamish, the squeamish among you, you're going to scream. Um, let's go with the clip from Paradise. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. you, you have not worked with Katharina Talbach nor Sunni Meadows before, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, bef before, before this, that. No, before no, no. Film. How, did you, how did you get them for those parts? Oh, poof, I just asked them. They were, or are still um, one of the most famous actresses in, in Germany, both of them. One in Berlin, the other one in Munich. And um, I had really admired them a great deal for a long time, and I just asked them. <laughs> well, they're spectacular in this film. Um, since you haven't seen the film yet, a quick nutshell synopsis is that in this film we have basically an academic marriage that's become just that, academic. Angelika Titza, an art historian, thinks that Victor, a zoology professor, must be having an affair since the spark has left their boring marriage long ago. She had him shadowed, uh, convinced that there's something going on uh, by an all-female detective agency, I think, right? Um, finds nothing and decides that in order to have the spark reignited, she'll introduce him to her old girlfriend, Lotte, a country girl who runs a country store. And uh, she is plain but intriguing, loves to play act, read uh, sections from Heart of Darkness and other literary works aloud and acting them up. They fall head over heels into passion. And um, I guess the only other thing we really need to know is that Angie, Angelica, has a real hang up about neatness and that probably explains why she behaves the way she does after Lotta stabs her. She appears to be more concerned with ridding herself of this sticky flypaper than trying to do something about the knife, right? Yeah. That wasn't always the title of the story or the film either. It what was it called before? Paradise. I can't remember. Wasn't it called Labyrinth? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was called yeah. Labyrinth, yeah. And well, I thought of that again because the um, dolly shots through Lotta's apartment at the end really emphasized the fact, as of course does the shot of Victor and the cockroach in his little cage that, that's very much a labyrinth. It's a bizarre movie. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, the names mean especially much in this film, it seems to me. I mean, the fact that Titsa is Russian for bird. Mm -hmm. So what's with Victor and the birds? Well, he's, he's a guy who can't fly. Yeah. You know, he wants to be a bird, but he can't fly. Yeah, with this film, we really took it to, to the extreme in every way. Uh, the story was very extreme, the way we shot it, um, the, the way the architect built the sets, and in every way we went to an extreme. It was very liberating, and uh, we were very, very proud of this film. Yeah. 
And when it came out, um, a lot of people were quite disappointed that it was not men part two, but somehow we got our ground back. We knew where we were. After men, everybody was just applauding this film and everybody, I mean, even people who I detested as critics, for instance, loved men. And after Paradise, I knew where I was at again because it really divided the, um, the audience and also the critics into people who hated it and people who loved it. And somehow that felt much more comfortable. <laughs> it must have felt more comfortable too to have more time, more money, because you did have a longer shooting schedule. Yeah, but that's before. yeah. But the thing about more money and more time is that it doesn't really solve your problems, because yeah. you always need even more. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. the more you get, the more you need. Mm -hmm. At some point during that time, in an interview, you categorized filmmaking as a legitimate form of tyranny. I remember that well. <laughs> Are you a tyrannical filmmaker? Well, as I said in the very beginning, I, I tyrannized my, tyrannized, tyrannized, is that a word? Tyrannized, yeah. Tyrannized my sisters, and um, right. it was just, you know, very logical to move from there into directing films. But many of the same people work with you over and over and over again, so you can't be beating them with the whip too many times. No, no, I'm not. On the contrary, I believe in, in destructing hierarchies because I think it's really quite stupid to keep up hierarchies just for the sake of a hierarchy. And I find it very easy to dissolve hierarchies and to invite everybody to, to participate in the development of a story and the way it's, it's being told. Um, still, of course, the director has to stay the boss to a certain degree only because of the way things are organized, but not on any other level, really. And that's what, where I get the most fun, too, when it becomes a collaborative thing and when everybody comes up with strange and weird and wonderful ideas. So is there a lot of on-the-shoot on improvising, as it were? Well, it depends. Yeah. Um, on, on Paradise, yes, I think there was a lot. And on Men, there was none because we didn't have the time. And it, it really varies from film to film. One scene I remember in Paradise that was written about a lot was in the aquarium when Lotte uh, basically jumps Victor, and supposedly that was Katharina Talbach's idea to do it that way, to show mm -hmm. that she's really crazy about him at this point. Yeah. Well, something very important happened at roughly that time in your life also. You married Helge. Well, that came later. That was after my American experience. <laughs> that was after the Hollywood movie. Oh, it was after me yes, and him. See, yes. my chronology is off even with that. <laughs> well, let's talk about the Hollywood movie just a little bit. Oh, yeah. That's mm. talk about me it. and him. Me and him. Ich und er. Uh, the story is probably quite well known. It's about a man and his best friend who isn't a dog, right? Uh, it's a man and his talking penis, a penis that actually talks to him. What first attracted you to <laughs> Alberto Moravia's novel? Well, it's a very political fable. <laughs> it really is. It's a political, uh, it's a, s a very political story written by Alberto Moravia in the late 60s. And it deals with anarchism and with uh, the, the urge to, to behave anarchistic and freely and the, the um, social obligation to not do that. Or yeah, the, the pressure by society and by politics and by all other sorts of regiments not to do that. And I thought that, yeah, I was going to make a film about anarchy <laughs> um, in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> and also about a talking penis in Hollywood. I was pretty naive, I guess. Uh, the reason why I did it was because a European uh, producer had become the head of a studio, um, Columbia Pictures at that time, and he kept um, encouraging me and he could say, yeah, you can do the films you want to do and just like you do them in, in Germany and yeah, we'll make movies that matter. That was his tagline. Um, small movies, not as expensive as everybody else's movies and we'll introduce the Euro style to Hollywood. So I believed him and it, um, in the beginning everything was pretty, pretty okay, but then he got fired very quickly. After six months he was gone and I was stuck there um, with, um, the normal Hollywood crowd, and, uh, or your regular studio people, and they could not believe what I was doing. <laughs> and <laughs> it got, um, well, at that time, it, it got really very um, 
dramatic, melodramatic for me, and I thought that I had to you know, give, give up my movie and I couldn't tell the story that I wanted to tell, and you know, all this melodramatic stuff that European film directors run into when they go to Hollywood. Um, with a little distance, it was all very, very funny, really. I mean, having to discuss um, the music that the penis would like to, look, uh, to listen to <laughs> and <laughs> insisting on jazz music, I would, and they you know, telling me, no, that would never be the case. It, was <laughs> <laughs> it just got totally out of hand. But uh, Europe and, and America is, I guess, still quite different from each other. In Europe, this film became a big success. <laughs> um, it was not my movie in, in the end because I, I did have to make many concessions and yeah, I had to re-edit it and redub it and do all sorts of things with the film and I don't like it very much. Uh, the producer loved it because uh, it made a lot of money in Europe, but that was it. Yeah. I understand though that in America, on the video rental scene and on late night cable vision, it did get shown and, and yeah. all right. Yeah, also in video stores in Lebanon, it's uh -huh. a big hit. <laughs> <laughs> a student from, a film student from Lebanon just told me that. <laughs> so yeah. One of the aspects that this film shares with most of your other, certainly later films, is a definite emphasis on music since you already brought music up. That at the end of a lot of your films, we uh, burst into songs. Uh, we have songs at the very end, the Banana Boat song at the end of Men, um, the Edith Piaf song later on in Nobody Loves Me, No Woman, No Cry, and uh, Everything's Gonna Be All Right in this song, uh, in this film. What particular significance do you ascribe to music and film? Well, I find it difficult to coordinate uh, music and dialogue, but I always use a good song in the end because I like myself, I like waltzing out of a movie theater. I like that. So <laughs> that's why I keep doing it, because I like to you know, leave the theater with a song in my, my head. So you finished the Hollywood movie. You married Helga, I think, in this country, right? Yeah. And you went back to Germany and did a movie called Money. Yeah, I decided after after, <laughs> yeah, strange, I made a movie called Money after my Hollywood experience. No, I had a six pictures deal still with the studio, but this experience with me and him had showed me quite clearly that I was not cut out for Hollywood, that I had to tell my own strange stories and do everything myself and be in charge of everything. And I couldn't really adapt. And I found it very exhausting to, uh, to have to talk to my own agent, for instance. I would you know, try to escape from my own agent all the time because I was not, um, I was not used to being uh, busy all the time and up all the time and you know, ready for a whole bunch of different projects from other people. I found that very exhausting when I could not really do my own stuff. And yeah. The movie has some funny moments. There's no question about it. Um, the main character, Carmen Müller. Oh, money, you mean, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm back on money, I'm sorry. And uh, her habit of taking Polaroids of things she's just prepared to eat. Why does, what, what makes her do that? Oh, because she's a frustrated housewife and nobody pays her any attention. Yeah. And um, she keeps preparing food and she puts up these wonderful meals every day. She puts them on the table and nobody acknowledges this. And uh, so she starts taking photos of the meals that she cooks because nobody else will ever even say thank you. Another film, another film that uh, did not get shown as the part of this retrospective was the next one, Happy Birthday Turke. What attracted you to uh, Jakob Arjuni's novel other than the fact that his stuff was very hot at the time? It was, I think, the third of three, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the Turks, the Turkish yeah. population, because you know, like in the very first film and in other films that I've done, I made a documentary about Turks in Germany as well. Um, I found it um, important to investigate how the Turks were living in Germany, how they were being treated and this whole issue of racism, which you know, keeps popping up in other films of mine. And um, that gave me the perfect storyline, this uh, detective story of a Turkish detective who um, 
uh, doesn't know Turkish anymore and has to investigate a case where he has to confront his own heritage mm -hmm. in Germany. And he's really ostracized to some extent by both, by the Germans yeah. and the Turks. Yeah. Um, one of the most astonishing scenes for me was a very little scene where one of the characters who's Turkish is shown to be working in an Italian restaurant and the women who file through this cafeteria line who flirt with him obviously assume that he is an Italian working Yeah, there. because Italians so they, are being yeah. not as, as um, the racism against Italians is by far not as heavy right. as against Turks. So a lot of Turkish people pretend they're Italian. And the film, just as a, uh, the film doesn't really translate very well because of um, national prejudices. When the film was shown sometimes in the States, for instance, I always had to explain who the Turks are and who the Germans are. The Turks are the guys with the black hair and mustaches, and the Germans are the ones who are a little lighter. But when you're not able to pick up on all the prejudices because they are not your own, uh, it, it doesn't translate, which was very interesting to me, how ingrained the prejudices really are, depending on where you are and where you grew up. Oh, yeah. You mentioned Fassbinder earlier as a filmmaker whom you admired, and you picked Pierre Rabin to do the music yeah. for Happy Birthday Turkey. What was that experience like? It was very dry, and I had hoped for, for more of a relationship with him, but he was very matter-of-factly and very dry and very detached. I think because he wasn't really doing very well physically, he didn't feel too good when he was doing it. Um, and the, yeah, one of the reasons why I wanted to have him was, of course, because I like his music, but also because of Fassbinder, because I really think that he's one of the greatest German filmmakers because he consistently has tried to tell stories about Germany, and again and again and again about every you know, part of the last century, and the very painful experiences and very very, um, it was very um, accurate about it too. Speaking of painful experience, uh, the scene that everybody seems to remember uh, from this <laughs> film is of course the toaster sequence. Uh, there's a scene late in the film when a guy who probably deserves it is tortured with a toaster which, is, uh, which first has his hand inserted into it which then is pressed against his cheek and which then is pressed against a far more sensitive part of his anatomy. Uh, it's, a, it's an unsettling sequence to say the least, one which during the premiere of the film in New York I noticed caused a couple of people to walk out. They just thought, this is, this is too much. Um, why doesn't a young woman who do this just reach for a chainsaw as she would in an American film? Because I'm very wary of pain and death in the movies. And um, at the same time, um, Robocop was opening in Germany. And I was the one who was being attacked for brutality. And not Robocop, not Prof. Verhoeven. And it, it really made sense because that was what I was trying to get at. That when you use violence in films, I think it should be used in a way where it really hurts. That you, you as, as the spectator really feel the pain. And what I'm very wary of is that we got so used to people dying and people getting slashed and killed in, in the most atrocious ways, but we don't feel it. It's very removed from us because it's, um, uh, it's, it's not real anymore. In the meantime, uh, I think I've, I've just decided to stay away from violence altogether because I, I don't really know how to handle it. And in that story, in a detective story, I had to use it because it was part of the story. You can't really shoot a detective uh, story, uh, or a film noir, without violence. That's a contradiction of terms almost. But if I had to use it, I wanted to make it as painful as possible. So it's clear that it is really a violent act and not you know, something that happens and doesn't hurt anybody. Well, but I, I find it a very difficult topic, very difficult to deal with. I have to confess, quite frankly, you had me worried before I really got to know you better because uh, small kitchen appliances in your films don't, don't do all that well. Yeah. Well, you then came to, to my place. You came to Holland's to teach screenwriting for a semester. And after that, uh, my, still my favorite of your films came out, Nobody Loves Me. And we'll look at a clip no, from that. Thank you. Thanks. 
wonderful. <laughs> Who's the picture on uh, next to um, next to the main character as she puts the tape in? I just noticed that uh, a picture. Yeah, there's a photograph. Oh, <laughs> I, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. It looks like a baby picture. Oh, of her. It's a oh, it picture of her. Yeah, it of Maria. Her. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's Maria Schrader. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the film has become a regular at my institution for Valentine's Day. It's an interactive <laughs> experience that, that is beyond the Rocky Horror Picture Show, <laughs> I promise. And Thank you so at, much. At That's the so same nice. time, uh, it's again an instance of a film which raises numerous serious themes, of course. First and foremost, uh, Germany's struggle with accepting the reality of a multicultural society once again. That apartment complex in which these characters dwell is a microcosm of, of that sort of thing. The characters that inhabit it are, are absolutely wonderful. One thing I thought about in, in mulling over the title is that nobody loves me is the kind of statement that I don't think anybody would be willing to make out loud for fear that somebody would say, yeah, you're absolutely right, you know, take a shower or something. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that many of us think about, I guess. Uh, you know, we wonder about that privately. And a little anecdote that I want to relate to you, because I don't think you ever heard it, is that one of your bumper stickers, remember that you had these little mm -hmm. stickers made for Nobody Loves Me, I've had on the back of my car for five years now. It was parked at the Charlotte, North Carolina airport once while I went to Germany. And when I came back, I saw from afar there's a note. And I thought, okay, one of my fenders is gone, something happened while I was gone. No, there was a note in perfect German saying, do not despair. The Lord loves you. Oh, and oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I'm I'm totally convinced that you know this was the work of the traveling televangelist from Wuppertal. <laughs> no question about it. A question that also goes through my mind every time I watch this film is the focus on excretory function, if we can put it that way. Lots of people go to the bathroom in this movie. They do? They do. We See, have, we my have mother is right then. Uh -oh. My mother keeps complaining about German films. She says, why is it that in every German film somebody goes to the bathroom? That's what my mother says. She she's right. I'm well, afraid she's, she's right. right. In, she's right in this case, absolutely, hmm. because you show Funny Fink at the beginning drawing her crosses while she's right. sitting there on the potty. You show, uh, uh, <laughs> you show Orfeo later on when they have this discussion and he ends the conversation with Papi. Uh, and then, of course, there's this right. notion that you get rid of the memory of uh, a former lover by eating pieces of his photograph and getting him quite literally out of your system. Um, right. I confess, so okay. It's right. there. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you don't mean to make a larger statement with this? Uh, no, again, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't offer you any theoretical explanation. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm Freud, a total flop. <laughs> Freud flew out the window completely. Well, <laughs> I thought it was something about anal retentive behavior, you know, that, that all these I people I could make are it up, but it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about elevators for a second then, because here we have this elevator again. It's not a Padanosta, but it's an elevator. And uh, as we already said, it's, it's a microcosm, but it either brings people together or it reinforces their isolation. I see it ultimately as a very positive space because the elevator, it seems to me, represents progress. It's going somewhere. These people are doing something. Yeah. They're not just passive, letting things happen to them. And the fact that she uh, with the help of Orfeo's chant, puts things in motion, uh, shows something. Orfeo is a complex character because we have to wonder, is he the ultimate con artist who just made off with an expensive Armani suit and with gold? Or is this really a science fiction movie? Uh, has he really been abducted by aliens? It seems to me, though, ultimately, the answer doesn't matter because... No. Because the movie really is about whether we still believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, isn't it? Yeah, well, what I was trying to do was to have a lot of um, fun material to play with, like you know, science, science fiction elements and, of course, comed comedy elements, and at the same time make 
or write a story or make a film about death and to have that as the theme, but to sort of disguise it with all these different elements uh, so that you know, I could drag you into it, into the story without scaring you off and then getting to the core of things. Now there's already a lot of Zen Buddhist thought in this film. Yeah. You were already uh, seriously into it by then. Yeah, um, but you don't need to know anything about Buddhism to watch this film. But what was a really interesting experience uh, with Nobody Loves Me was when it was playing in Vietnam as one of the very first films of uh, Germany. And um, the only code that the Vietnamese audience had to understand such a story was Buddhism, because there are no women who live by themselves in, in Vietnam, and you know a whole lot of story elements which uh, were completely alien to them wouldn't have made any sense without this Buddhist uh, code. And they saw it completely as a Buddhist tale. And it was interesting to me that they picked up on everything that I put in there, but isn't really important to understand the story. I think less than a year after the film came out, um, Helgit, your husband, who had also done the camera work on all your films, starting with Men, I believe, yeah, was diagnosed with cancer and then passed away. No, well, he shot the movie Undergoing Chemotherapy, yeah. which um, made the, the shoot of this movie very light. He wasn't the only one. There was uh, one person in the crew uh, with HIV positive and um, other people who were suffering from, from illnesses. And because we were dealing with death, the shoot was very, very light and very easy somehow. So I guess that's you know, true a lot of times that, yeah, when you get down to serious business, things do become quite light in a different way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I remember you told me at one point in a conversation we had shortly after, after Helga passed away, your thoughts uh, as you were in a hospital looking out at the clouds from the window that quite automatically something that one of the characters or feel or feel yeah. says pass through my view remember exactly what, what well it, these lines by Orfeo was just popping out of my mouth and i was mumbling them to myself which was really quite surprising to me that i was all of a sudden getting lines from my own film mm -hmm. and Orfeo keeps telling uh, funny that she shouldn't be sad because everything is changing and even grief and hardship cannot stay, it can never you know, always stay the same, that everything is always changing, that everything is impermanent. Even, he says, the shit is impermanent. Yeah. He has a very drastic way of expressing things. The next film we won't really need to talk about this evening, that's one last glimpse because you were here for the screening mm -hmm. and there was a discussion at that time. Um, I'm wondering though whether you bought the Van Morrison CD Enlightenment when it first came out in 1990. Yeah, I yeah. guess, because I, I have all the Van Morrison's uh, CDs, so yeah, I and probably got it, it when it came out. It really belongs into this. There's and I could never use his music be for, a, for a feature film because his music is too expensive normally, but for a TV film, I could just put it all in and the TV company has to pay for it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, then we get to Am I Beautiful? And we'll look at a quick clip from Am I Beautiful? <laughs> you really picked the gooey part, well, huh? Well, I'm beginning to wonder also, people are going to start thinking you specialize in slasher movies or some other type of slice and dice endeavor, but that's not the case. Um, it's an amazing sequence, though, and that's why I picked it, because one has to approach it with very mixed emotions. You laugh, and at the same time, you're horrified, and you feel guilty for, for you know, laughing at I mean, when, when she flops on the bed like that and when she starts with, with the body painting, it's, it's funny while being horrible at the same time. Yeah, I guess that's what really fascinates me, the ambivalence of things. Yeah. That's what I try to depict in each story that I write, I guess, and also in every film, and to understand what it really is and how things can shift from one moment to the next, that something funny can end, end up being tragic and that something tragic can be very funny. I, I think probably for most viewers, the German concept of Schadenfreude, the joy in the misfortune that befalls others, 
applies because most of us probably watch Herbert, who's cheating on his wife after a 30-year marriage, and we go, yep, he's getting his come up and serves him right, right? But at the same time, uh, we really do hope that he gets the place cleaned up before Santa Berger comes home, right? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the ambivalence, <laughs> even of the spectator. <laughs> yeah. The Herbert in the short story, which serves as the model, is really a much nastier guy. Yeah. Um, who, I mean, th this guy is played by Gottfried Jon, also thinks of him for himself first and foremost. He's, he says, you know, how, how can you do this to me? And when he notices the blood on himself, he starts wiping it off. But the guy in the short story, when he takes her to the emergency room in the hospital, immediately starts lusting after a nurse. He comments on her, on her breasts. I mean, he's, he's a totally despicable individual. But of course, he's one of many despicable or uh, unfortunate or lamentable or sad or happy individuals in this mosaic of the German landscape. The, the question that I'd like to pursue just a little bit is why in this movie does everybody leave Germany? They go to Spain. What are they hoping to find in Spain? Yeah, it's the big German dream yeah. to go down south to Italy or Spain. France doesn't count, but Italy or Spain <laughs> are the lands of our dreams. And we continuously hope that when we go to those countries, we will change and we will find the real life, la vida verdadera, and um, we'll stop um, wanting to be somebody else or someplace else once we are in those countries. Mm -hmm. And it does work for you know, three weeks, four weeks, summer vacation, it works. We become much more open because we take off our clothes, our winter clothes, our warm clothes, and we, um, we think that um, we're much nicer, and maybe we are when we're in the South, and then we inevitably go home and become quite cold again and quite, quite um, yeah, closed. And it did happen to us when we were shooting the film. It was really quite remarkable that the German staff, the German crew, um, became very different. We did, we were different human beings. We were much more communi communic communicative. Mm -hmm. We were much more open with each other. And we, again, you know, were lighter. We were just 10 pounds lighter in spirit. And the minute we came back to Germany, also at a very bad time in November, when you know, it gets dark and miserable, the weather, um, we, we could not keep that up with each other. We became very closed off again, and we became very German again. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is the, a very old German dream. You know, Goethe went to Italy and became somebody else. Everybody <laughs> tries to. In a number of your films, including this one, there are carnivals or there is carnival-like activity, which obviously suggests something. Yeah, well, the carnival was important for Nobody Loves Me because it uh, signifies the, the um, beginning of the fasting period and um, it's all about carne, flesh, carnival. And, f and flesh and death have a lot to do with each other in um, Catholic, um, I, uh, Catholic uh, rituals, or in, in Carnival in particular, and since the whole theme of the film was death, it made perfect sense to shoot it during Carnival in, Col in Cologne, and Carnival in Cologne is a big deal, and there are all these, these death images and metaphors in the actual Carnival, and um, in Nobody Loves Me, the Semana Santa in Sevilla, which to you might look like the Ku Klux Klan, and it's, it's maybe a little difficult to just you know, forget all those associations and um, see the processions as medieval processions, which they really are. Um, it was important to me to use that because, um, again, it's something that we've lost in Germany as rituals where you um, open up your heart, which really happens in Spain during the Semana Santa, that you stand there with other people and you start weeping all together. And then, as I showed in, in Emma Beautiful, you start singing these songs, which are basically rap songs. You, song, you sing about your own pain and your own individual experience, but everybody can listen to it and everybody will applaud you when it's really heartfelt. When I can feel your pain, then I'll applaud you during the Semana Santa. And that's very un-German too, but we all long for that, for this shared experience, and to share our pain. I guess that's what I was trying to get at. I think the behavior of a lot of the characters in this film shows that 
that's not where their priorities are, that their priorities are misplaced, that they yeah. worry all too much about things that ultimately don't matter. And of course, yeah. that's the question posed by the title. Bin ich schön, it doesn't matter, ultimately, yeah. right? I mean, in a literal sense, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that we have a girl willing to prostitute herself for a pair of sunglasses. That's misplaced priorities when she should be doing something else. Right? Your most recent film, an excerpt from which we'll skip because it was just shown last night and because we do want to leave enough time for question and answer when we're done in just a little bit, is Enlightenment Guaranteed, uh, your first feature film shot on digital video with a very interesting look done with a very small crew. You were quoted as saying you wanted this done by only as many people as could fit into a car. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And it was also a very special experience under the circumstances working with two of your uh, regular actors again because they, in part at least, are themselves. They maintain their names. And, uh, well, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what conditions were like during the shoot in Japan. Yeah, I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, so I don't want to mm. bore anybody. But um, it was a very liberating experience for all of us, also for the actors. And because they're so experienced, they could be that private, probably, because they know exactly how much to show and not get hurt. And it's, it's very difficult to tell whether they're really still acting or whether they're just themselves. And they were very aware of that risk, but um, they just went ahead and did it. And they became more and more courageous. And they realized, just like myself, that you are really always protected when it stays fiction. Because nobody will ever be able to say, oh, that was the real Uwe, and that was the, the actor Uwe. As long as you call something fiction, you will be protected. It's just like writing fi fiction. I can use the first person, and still you won't be able to really know and tell whether it's me or a fictitious um, character that I made up. So it made us um, very, very free to move into all directions and to also um, give up on concepts, which in itself is a Buddhist concept. No, it's a Buddhist teaching not to have concepts. And I had tried that in the documentary, One Last Glimpse, in a very radical manner. But then I tried to take that and use it for a feature film and get away from all these concepts that you know, I had done for so long. It was a screenplay that was very fixed and um, every shot that you, I list up up front and everything was just so, um, uh, I don't know what to call it really. Regimented. It, uh, yeah, I I'd, I'd still had fun making those films and, and I didn't feel fenced in, but to just completely forget about all that was quite a challenge. Yeah. An interesting thematic link that I see between this film and Mena is that the two guys in this movie essentially, uh, as far as making a living is concerned, deal with uh, selling a, a package, selling space or rearranging space. And of course, Julius Armbrust in Men was in packaging. So it's this emphasis again on the exterior, on something which is a container, which in and of itself has little, if any, value certainly no more value, far less value than what it contains, what's inside. Um, and that seems to be a theme that really runs through all of your films. Yeah, and also, you know, the, the original concept to, uh, no concept, but again, a concept to Enlightenment Guaranteed was what would the guys from men do 15 years later? And they would probably be completely stuck in their lives and go to a Japanese monastery and meditate and try to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And in a way, we really did get back to the spirit of men, of the making of the film Men. We got our innocence back. And uh, now that you're talking about it, I realize it myself. We, we got rid of all the stuff that had accumulated throughout the years. Also, you know, big, big budgets, money, <laughs> but also a sort of limiting experience where you just know how to do things and then you just keep doing the things you have done before because you know that they work. And with Enlightenment Guaranteed, we didn't know whether any of that would work. We didn't even know whether the technique would work mm -hmm. trans to transfer the mini DV to 35 and still have a big commercial film, which it was in Germany. Yeah. 
one of the ad posters for that film showing the Japanese moon with a light switch on mm -hmm. the inside is already a classic, as of course is your poster for men showing the very male banana <laughs> uh, poster that was not used in the United States for some strange reason. <laughs> <laughs> An innocent banana, I wonder. <laughs> how, how much input do you give yourself into that kind of decision, the posters, the advertising? Well, the banana was Helga's idea mm -hmm. because nobody from the distribution company could come up with an idea yeah. for the poster. The light switch was my idea. I tried to really you know, be there until the very end and I get very, very frustrated usually with the distribution people and the promotion people and that's the, the worst part about filmmaking usually. What about the website, the official website for Enlightenment guaranteed. The fortune cookies, yes. they were my idea. <laughs> uh -huh. The fortune cookies and the party for 10 for a catered sushi dinner? That was the distribution <laughs> company. Uh -huh. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. Well, very recently, Die Zeit called Doris Delia one of the top German writers today. The third one in your series of illustrated children's books, illustrated by Julia Kergel, just came out, Lotte und die Monster. Two of them are out already, one available in English translation, mm -hmm. uh, Lotte will Prinzessin sein, Lotte's princess dress, and the second one, Lotte in New York. And of course, Diogenes just published your latest book, a novel entitled, Was machen wir jetzt? Now what, I guess, in English. Which brings us to the important question, now what? What, <laughs> what is Doris Dörje going to do next? Acting, for example, I understand. Acting? Yep, you just played a dentist. Oh, that's right, yeah. In Pierre <laughs> Sanusi Bliss's yeah. first film. Yeah, I make cameo yeah, appearances yeah. sometimes, they're fun, yeah. What, what now? Well, I'm writing and we'll make another film and you know, just keep going somehow. Right. Well, before we open the floor for questions and answers, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the wonderful folks here at The Walker. Yeah. Cheryl, Lucas, also Mike and Anita, of the Regis Foundation. I would like to thank all of you for being such interested listeners. And of yes. course, I want to thank Doris for spending this time with us. Please join me. But thank you. But thank you. Thank you. Now, I can't say this often enough, what a wonderful experience this has been to come here and to have these really interesting talks with you and the fact that you all came to see the movies and that you're here tonight. and yeah, Thank you, everybody, you and the people from The Walker. Now, it'll be difficult for us to see because of the lights, so raise your hands high, please, for, for any questions. Yes? I can see anybody here. <laughs> okay, in, in two minutes? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's really quite a privilege to be able to travel back and forth because it, it somehow sharpens my focus on my own country. And um, uh, you know, I, I, America is such a diversified country. You really can't you know, say something valid about this country in one sentence or anything, I think, when you're a foreigner. Uh, but that's part of the attraction, that it's... There's so many different things happening in this country and so many different people living here. And it's, um, it's, it's like getting um, an injection of, of energy every time I come here. And one thing, um, it's, it's a little bit like playing the, the um, ad Advocatus Diaboli. What's that in English? Devil's Advocate. Yeah, yeah. De okay. When I go back to Germany or when I come here, um, the th line that I say the most to my students in Germany is, just do it. And I, I feel like, like a salesperson for Nike by this time. <laughs> but it seems to be one of the major cultural differences. And I don't understand why that is. But in, in Europe altogether, it's not just Germany, we seem to have this attitude of saying, oh, i rather not. Rather, better not, better not. Instead of saying, yeah, just do it. Come on, let's try. And if we make a mistake, we'll just, you know, try again. And it's something that I deeply admire about this country, to just be willing to try out things, and if they don't work, you just 
try something else. And it's something that we have tremendous difficulties with in Europe. And I don't know why that is. It's just a major difference. That didn't un answer your question at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Did it? No. Uh, yeah? I yeah? Well, I think right now it's just very, very difficult to, to make any statements because everything is, is happening so fast and, and different, um, different directions or different um, developments are taking place at the same time. And I think that on one hand, becoming global is really a little too much for us <laughs> at times. And we're becoming, because of it, we're becoming more tribal, which can be very interesting, but it can also be very, very dangerous as we saw in, in Europe, you know, the last war uh, in, in Serbia was because of this. So I think it's very difficult right now to balance these thing, two things, to become more international or more global, more interesting, versus uh, this tendency and this urge to become smaller and, and to stick to your people and your tradition and your own thing, which can also be very interesting, but can also be very dangerous. So everything can really tip to one side or the other right now. So these are exciting times, but also very unbalanced times. So I don't know. I mean, I envy, when, I, when I'm here, I really envy you for being able to live in this, in the, in this um, town with something like the Walker Institute. And today I, I drove down um, Lake Avenue and I saw this wonderful photo project and you know, all these different people living in this one street and I thought, oh God, Munich is so boring. I have to go back to <laughs> Munich. <laughs> Ugh. But at the same time, yeah, you know, in Munich it's very easy to communicate because it's so small and you walk everywhere and, and everything is around the corner and it, you can't really you know, evaluate one thing against the other. It all has its advantages and its disadvantages. Advantages. <laughs> there was a question down here. Mm -hmm. I knew you wanted. And at the time, you were extremely, and you were very right, you were extremely critical of the American National Union. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really having fun this evening hearing you speak about sort of the changes and kind of um, admiring, uh, liking to have fun. And I like, I have a love affair with Europe myself. Um, Oops. And I fear that is happening. And I'm more on your side than you were in 1974. <laughs> and I was then. And it sounds like maybe you've come a different way from when you were then. You were very Marxist then. Yeah, but everybody, or, yeah, <laughs> everybody was. And, um, well, no, all Americans weren't. <laughs> oh, all right, OK. Everybody in Europe was, yeah. OK, so do you, how do you feel now? About Marxism? About hmm? capitalism. Capitalism. American-inspired capitalism. Oh, again, you know, it's such a difficult question. Um, capitalism brought down the wall, you know. So, yeah, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I mean, first of all, I think it's a good thing. Um, then, when I think about it a little more, I'm not even sure whether it was capitalism which brought, brought down the wall. I think it was American pop culture that brought down the wall because people were so hungry and thirsty for American pop culture. And I think that that was really what, what made things happening on a very subconscious level. And um, that in itself is a very good thing. So, you know, things are ambivalent, <laughs> they really are. And talking about globalism again, yes, everything is becoming more globalized and there was uh, you know, one word for it in, in the late 60s. It was uh, Stamokap. It was 
state monopolist capitalisms, Damokov, I can't even pronounce the name anymore. Back then I was very <laughs> fluent in those terms. Um, but at the same time, because of the internet, people in China are able to form a democratic movement only because of the internet, which might be a very capitalistic um, enterprise. In the beginning it was. And now it's becoming something else again, you know? So everything can really change. And one thing that is bad on one level may be really good for, for other people, like you know, the internet in China. That's really something very exciting and something very good and, and new. Yeah, hmm. I don't really know what capitalism is anymore. I don't want to change Europe. No, 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 I'm not for capitalism, but I don't really know what it is anymore because it's not um, all that easy anymore. It used to be much easier to be against it. And you know, it did change the, the way of the world, East and West. And we're battling with that. We really are in Germany because it's difficult. but. I think it's better than the way it was before. You know, what do you want to have? Uh, you want to you know, live in a suppressed society without capitalism? Yeah, okay, you don't have the capitalism, but you don't have the freedom either. And it's an interesting question because when you ask the, the East German population this question, a lot of them would say, yeah, capitalis capitalism is really a bad thing because it didn't do anything at all for us in the end, and now we're really stuck here and we don't really know where to move to and, and what to do with our lives. But at the same time, they would say, yeah, but we don't really want the wall back either. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. Question up there. Women filmmakers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has never really been an issue, women filmmakers, because in my generation, I don't think it ever um, made any difference, really. And I hope I'm not wrong about it, but whoever I talk to who's my age pretty much agrees that for us it was never an issue. For the generation of filmmakers like Margarete von Trotta, Ola Stöcke, you know, those women, it really did make a big difference because uh, for them it was really very difficult to, to become filmmakers and to, to do this, but for us it wasn't anymore. And it's the difference of 15 years. Yeah. How about the younger generation? I mean, it's, it's coming out now, but you're pretty much switched. Well, in, in our film school it's exactly 50-50. And I don't think the women have any doubts about um, their career or that they, they don't think it's would be diffi more difficult for them because they're women, not at all. What they are very aware of, and that's new to me, is that um, they allow a certain amount of time for their career, and they're very aware of the fact that if they want to have a family, they have to plan it way ahead. And I was not aware of that at all. I didn't have a career plan, I didn't have a family plan, I didn't have very much of a plan <laughs> altogether. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I wanted to uh, sort of along the lines of our question. Uh, I'm interested in, in how you see your, well, a, a number of things, but how you see German cinema developing. You're, 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 you've already positioned yourself generationally in, in an interesting way because you're sort of a transition figure, a transition generation between this older generation Well, it's always very difficult for filmmakers or artists in general to evaluate themselves among their peers and, and to see themselves outside of what they're doing themselves. So an analysis of this is very difficult for me. Um, 
what's happening right now in Germany is quite interesting, I think, because many different films are being made. Um, I don't see anything like a movement, but a great a variety of films. What is happening in Europe is maybe more interesting or more worrisome, too, that um, the more European we get on an economical level, the less interested we are in each other's culture. So you won't find any European films playing in, in other European countries anymore, like they used to. It's a very, very small percentage of you know, French, Spanish, Italian films get to Germany and vice versa. It, this is true for every European country. Somehow, we just don't have the energy or curiosity or I don't know what it is anymore to, besides from the economics, be interested in each other's culture anymore. That I find um, worrisome. And that seems to be a trend. And um, what, what a lot of filmmakers tried for the past 15 years was to invent the European film. And by now, we all know, no, it does not exist. The European film does not exist. But a film that translates to other European countries does not exist either anymore. It's everybody for himself. And that is fairly new. So we will have the Euro in a year from now, but we don't have any, any transitions anymore between the different countries. We have more, each country has more you know, English, English uh, literature and um, American movies, of course, than any, from any other country within Europe. And that's the way things are right now. We don't seem to be interested in each other right now. Well, <laughs> that was part of the reason why I made Enlightenment Guaranteed on, DV, on a digital technique on a, with a DVD camera. Not DVD, with mini DV, which is, again, something else. Uh, because I, I was trying to show my film students that you can make a feature film for very little money. But they are dreaming of 35. And they want to make The Gladiator, part <laughs> three, or I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> I was, I was hoping for them to catch on, and they didn't really. It's too small scale for them. Or their dreams, they don't, want to be, they don't want their dreams to become video and, and small scale, which I understand, but I, I understand it on one hand. On the other hand, I don't understand it because it just liberates you enormously to be able to work that way. And I'm in a very luxurious position. I don't have to, on the contrary, I have to, for enlightenment guaranteed, I had to fight off money. I had to tell the producers, no, I want to make it small. I want to keep it small. I don't want to make a big movie. Because of course, the distributors always want to make a big movie because they think they can promote it big and it's gonna be big because of all the bigness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I started writing prose because I couldn't write screenplays. I found screenplays very, very difficult to write because they force you to look at your characters from the outside. Of course, uh, you have to show what people do. And I found that very difficult. And in order to understand my characters better, I started writing short stories about them, sometimes in the first person. Um, but I wrote them in order to get into their heads and into their souls. And after I had written the short story, I could write the screenplay, because then I knew them so well that I could just show them from the outside, but I knew why they did certain things a certain way. So that's how I started writing prose. And then something really wonderful happened to me that I'm really you know, hoping, every, I, I really hope that it happens to every artist and at some point in his life or her life. Um, a publisher from Switzerland, who owns a very famous publishing house, he uh, found out about my short stories and he came to Munich and convinced me to show him these stories. And ever since then, he encouraged me to keep writing prose. You know, he, one of these people who find you and really believe in you and make you do things that you wouldn't do on your own. And um, that's what I did. And I wrote you know, seven volumes of short stories because of him. 
But then some people from, from some of these short stories wanted to be in a movie. They wanted to <laughs> become film stars. <laughs> and they wanted to do something else, so they stuck to me. And Alfeo and Fanny, for instance, the characters from Nobody Loves Me. And then also for Am I Beautiful, I had divided my prose and my screenplays by that time to such a degree that I would write all the things that I never wanted to shoot in the short stories because they were too complicated and too, too expensive and too uh, all these things that I didn't want to shoot. But then, again, yeah, I had the feeling it would be, after all these straightforward storylines, it would be interesting to have many people try to achieve the same goal and meet in various ways. So I tried to adapt 15 short stories in uh, Am I Beautiful? I do. It's my only way sometimes to get close to a character to write prose about him or her. And also, your know, film language is really quite a limited language. And you have to really condense things a lot and make things m simpler. And I can only make them simpler when I know the whole picture. I can't really go the other way around somehow. And then, you know, it, it just feeds off each other. I did Enlightenment, the film, and at the same time I wrote a novel about a father who has to go to a monastery with his 16-year-old daughter because his 16-year-old daughter has fallen in love with a lama, a Tibetan lama. And um, he accompanies her to this monastery to prevent her from running off with the lama. And he hates everything at the monastery. He hates the people. He hates Buddhism. He hates everything. But he's forced to stay. And in the end, of course, he picks up on it. And he doesn't get enlightened, but he's beginning to understand that there's maybe something to it. So those two things had a lot to do with each other thematically. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the way that the actors seem to be believed? Particularly, uh, Sergio Goya played her in the, the, the bride sequence in Am I Beautiful? How much does she bring to that? I, I, I know there's a lot in, that's in the story, but there's a lot. Yeah. Well, I have a very good relationship to all my actors because otherwise I can't work. And somehow I've been very lucky. I've never ever cast an actor who I didn't like or who I didn't get along with or actress. And it's, it's a little difficult for me to answer you because it's a process that um, just keeps happening. You know, she says something, I say something, and we feed off each other and then it becomes a line or it becomes this, it becomes um, her necklace, it, just tiny things, they just keep evolving as we go along. And um, I can't really separate these two things anymore, you know, I can't say, okay, this is what she did, and this is what I did. But I encourage all the actors to, to come up with um, not only ideas, but also with very stupid ideas. A lot of times you have really stupid ideas, and then you just have to turn this idea around a little bit and it becomes a brilliant idea. And that's one of my tricks at the set, that I try to encourage everybody to make a fool of him or himself or herself. And I'm the first one to make a fool of myself. Because it's really about opening up and, and daring to show that you're not really all that great, not all that brilliant, not all that beautiful, and all that, you know, I can go on and on and on. And then things start happening. Pardon me? Is that how the, 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 uh, the thing in the lift? The lift. Did, did, I mean, did you find that? Or did that That's all written. But the nuances, of course, uh, they, they start happening when everybody is together, the crew and the, the actors. With Enlightenment Guaranteed, there were no lines almost through that, throughout the entire film. Sometimes I wrote some dialogue up in the morning and I just shoved it to the actors a minute before we started shooting. But a lot of it was really improvised and I just gave them the general direction and the theme. And we would improvise for about 10 minutes and tape it. It's cheap, you know, video, you can tape it. 
and then I would just limit it or cut it down, uh, the content. I would tell them to just do it again and use those lines, the lines that they had invented, but drop other stuff and just you know, make it shorter and shorter and shorter until we had a two-minute scene. Yeah, my producer is really afraid that I might want to just do small movies <laughs> from now on because it's such great fun. And um, we were so completely free to do whatever we wanted to do. But I'm going to make a big movie next year, end of next year. But I also want to do the small ones. The big one is going to be very big because it's going to be a, a um, period piece in Vienna. <laughs> One more question, maybe? Yes. Can you talk about critics and the relationship with critics a little bit? It's nice you guys get to use the fraternity to, to tell somebody that their interpretation of your movie was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you just don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a total hypocrite with critics. I hate them when they don't like my films. And the next time when they write a good review, I love the same man who I detested before, <laughs> only because he's good, written a good review. Um, I, I worked as a film critic during film school, and I know how dependent, how dependent reviews are on your mood. And especially at 10 o'clock in the morning, the press screenings are usually at 10 in the morning, and it's a beautiful day out, and you have to go into the dark movie theater and still smelly from the popcorn from last night, and you don't really want to see this movie, and you just had a fight with your boyfriend. And it, yeah, it's going to be a bad review, only because of that. <laughs> and also, when you do have very little time, it also is quite likely that you write a bad review, because it's much easier to write bad reviews. So I try to remember all that, and I try to see how relevant uh, the, the circumstances are, at the same time, I get incredibly hurt, and I get really mad, and I want to kill them all when they write a bad review. And um, my daughter and my boyfriend, they sort out the reviews by now <laughs> before they give them to me, <laughs> because they, they just um, don't want me to get that mad all the time. I really get very upset. I would like to, I would like to add just one thing to that, if I may. Uh, first of all, I do think that there is, uh, in Doris's case, clearly, uh, a gender issue at work as far as the negative critics are concerned. I mean, you've, you've gotten some real serious flack down the road, which I think a man would not have gotten. And secondly, I definitely believe that there is something about German film critics that's absent in American film critics but only a couple of exceptions. The only one that really comes to my mind right offhand is uh, Roger Ebert and, and his you know, total inability to, to find any value with David Lynch, for example. I mean, he's not alone in this, I realize that, but um, th there's such a, um, a nastiness at times that I see. Uh, for example, one review I stumbled upon for, for uh, Enlightenment Guaranteed just dismissed the film as a, as a travel uh, home video and ultimately called the uh, intention behind it a frechheit, an outrage. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's no longer criticism, that's just venting. Yeah, right? but on the other hand, I really can't complain. I also get you know, really good reviews, but I can't remember them. I can only remember the bad ones. <laughs> it's a defect that I think a lot of people have. But yeah, you get hundred good reviews, but you only remember this one bad review and this one line that this guy wrote years back. Doris, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.